Hi everybody, I'm Lori Fulbright with News on 6 and I am so excited today to be joined by Dr. Casey Schramm, the president of OSU Center for Health Sciences. So today we're going to talk about all the amazing accomplishments of the past year as well as the enormous challenge that's been presented to our public health system in the state because of the global pandemic of COVID-19. So I'm so glad to be here today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Good, okay, so we have a lot of great things yes. to talk about today. So tell us if you want, kind of start us off on some of the things that you want people to know and then we'll get into kind of the meat of the things. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I think kind of probably starting out a little bit with the pandemic, of course, because I think that's always looming with everyone right now. Um, you know, as, as we kind of started to see our first case early in March, um, I served as uh, the physician on the governor's task force. And one of the things we were really looking at uh, with the state was that we were having a big challenge with testing. And, you know, that's so foundational for um, really everything that you would do in a response to a pandemic. And um, we started really looking at what could we do because what was occurring was the health department was having a hard time ramping up their testing capacity. And so all the testing was being reserved for uh, healthcare workers and hospitalized patients, or we were sending specimens out to other parts of the state, which could, or out, outside of the state, which could take two weeks to get results back. Um, and so we were, we, the governor was really calling on the universities to be creative, think about ways that we could innovate in, as Oklahomans take care of one another. Um, I'm really proud to say that OSU really, really stepped up in a big way. Our faculty here, our leadership here, really took that call seriously. And within 10 days of, of us requesting that, they were able to partner with the Oklahoma Animal Diagnostic Lab, which was uh, run under the College of Veterinary Medicine, um, to stand up a testing lab that has today processed over 125,000 tests. It's amazing. And it's amazing. It, yes, and it has really, you know, been the outstanding leadership of some folks here on our campus, um, Dr. Johnny Stevens, Dr. Anil Call. Um, uh, Mike Shea has led in those efforts um, really to just, you know, work with the leadership in Stillwater to bring that together. Um, and then in addition to that, we've been able to expand that testing capacity to this campus. Um, and we just continue to um, really see that um, be foundational for the entire state. <clears throat> and. You know, I, I think our faculty here on campus have really responded um, not only to the needs of the students and switching very quickly to online learning, yes. as well as, you know, taking care of patients, um, switching that to online working and, and really just, you know, being dedicated to meeting the needs of our students and our patients. So it takes a lot of flexibility, no yes. doubt, to, to do all that, to make all those switches. So tell us about the faculty and staff who are not only sharing their knowledge in the classroom, but also now with frontline workers, you know, physicians. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it really, our, our frontline workers have, you know, really been dedicated to taking care of our patients. Um, Dr. Uh, Mo Som um, has, is the chief of staff at our hospital, and, you know, she's been a constant um, you know, voice of reason and strong leadership over there at the hospital, keeping everyone informed. Um, you know, during this time, really, uh, as we were educating the entire state on the hospital plan for the state, um, our testing plans, we utilized Project ECHO, which is here at OSU CHS, led by uh, Dr. Johnson and Tara Jackson. Um, they did a wonderful job of working with the state to keep everyone informed um, and make sure that we're taking the knowledge that was necessary and really pushing it out there to the front lines. So, I mean, really ac across our entire system from our nurses, our physicians, um, uh, just being willing to, to be nimble and respond to the needs um, in, in the moment uh, and really do what was best for the state. Tell us about this agreement now between OSU and Langston. That's historic. Yes, yes. So there, just recently there was an announcement um, that I think will be a, a great partnership where OSU will begin to um, 
partner with Langston in some cases to begin to kind of take over some uh, educational programs that Langston's no longer going to, to offer here in Tulsa and really give students the flexibility to, to keep uh, continuing in their education here in Tulsa but will allow OSU to expand on some programs um, and uh, going forward we'll begin to partner with Langston for a nursing program here in Tulsa. So, so you touched on transforming, you know, the human, the diagnostic testing lab. You know, just I don't think people can appreciate the effort that took, and I think the public was shocked how fast you did it. How did you guys manage to do it so quickly? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, as we were starting to really hear about what was going on and that need. Um, we at the Center for Health Sciences were, were trying to understand what we could do to be helpful. At the same time in Stillwater, they were looking across their system. And I, I think that really that willingness and determination to, to help Oklahomans really helped facilitate us doing that very quickly. But to get a lab certified in 10 days is just, it's, it's very remarkable. Mm -hmm. And really that partnership ended up being something that was looked at nationally as a model. And, and we had very, uh, we had several land grant universities reaching out to us to say, you know, how did you do that? And wanting to, to really take that model and put it in place in their state. And, you know, some were successful and some were not. Sure. But I, I think that's just a testament to the determination and the leadership that we have here at OSU. Would you call that one of your prouder moments during this pandemic? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, it, it was something that we were really struggling with and trying, we needed to get that in place very quickly. Um, and to have OSU step up in that way did make me very proud. And I, I think it, it really highlighted OSU's land grant mission and how, you know, having a medical school that is attached to a land grant university is such an advantage because you know that land grant mission is really to you know take research and um, and education and really apply that to all citizens across the state and so kind of drawing on that and having the ability to really take that mission and and really showcase it in a way that was so beneficial at at a very crucial moment in time was it was a game changer I mean it was a game changer for yes. the entire state it's yes. just it's really very impressive yeah. so what is on the horizon right now for testing capacity yes so what we've done recently is move so you know the Oklahoma Animal Diagnostic Lab in addition to them doing human samples they were continuing to operate their diagnostic lab their genomic lab that takes care of all animals across the state and so what we've done is taken that and moved it to uh, a freestanding lab outside of the Oklahoma Animal Diagnostic Lab, but that will allow us to increase our testing capacity by 300%. So, you know, we, we have already, you know, tested and, and run, you know, like I said, over 125,000 yeah. samples, but that's going to allow us to do this more quickly, more efficiently. Um, we've, we've stayed really on the cutting edge, too, as far as looking at, you know, how do we take saliva, saliva samples mm -hmm and uh, utilize those because, you know, it's easier to collect, um, it's quicker. Those are things that, you know, if, if you're familiar with like 23andMe, people give saliva samples at home and you can send those in. So we're really trying to stay on the cutting edge um, to be able to, to be flexible, allow more Oklahomans to um, get really the testing that they need in the most convenient and quickest way possible. So not that every month hasn't been a big month around here yeah. um, since the spring, but tell me about August and this partnership with the Cherokee Nation. Yes. Well, so that was, you know, really a, a great moment where I think many years of hard work, um, it, was, it was really kind of a, a, the moment where that dream is realized where, you know, now we have 54 students um, at the Cherokee Nation, which is the first tribally affiliated medical school in the United States. Uh, right here in Oklahoma. But what is really remarkable, I think, too, about this, this class, 18% are Native American, but for the first time in the history of, of this medical school, there's 50% females. It's, it, that is the first time that we have hit that, that threshold, and so we're really proud of that class. I think it's gonna be transformative for 
uh, not only the Cherokee Nation, but the rural community surrounding, um, not only for the health care that we can provide there, but when you think about how transformative, you know, when you have many, you know, many citizens in the Cherokee Nation or rural citizens, kids, don't have the opportunity to actually interact with a medical student or see that. And so sometimes we can only dream or aspire to be what we see. And so as those, you know, uh, children are exposed to having a medical school in that community, um, you'll begin to see more of them seeking medicine as a career. And really, you know, one of the things that is, was really, I think, st stuck with me, something that um, Chief Baker would always say is they wanted to do things that would, were transformative to the next seven generations. Well, when you think about, you know, if you take someone and they become a doctor, how transformative that is for the generations to come, not only for their immediate family, but how that level of education um, opens opportunities for that family and the future generations. So not only having a health impact on the community, but on families as well. There's just so much going on yeah. on this campus yeah. that people have no idea of all these great things. Yeah. So let's talk about this a little bit because we are seeing enrollment in some higher institutions kind of lagging. So talk to me about the enrollment here and how you guys have remained so strong. Yeah, so we are doing, you know, very well with enrollment as, you know, some institutions are seeing decreasing enrollment. OSU, Center for Health Sciences, is seeing an increase. And, you know, our faculty have done a great job of identifying um, academic programs that are necessary for the workforce. And so it really, you know, attracts students because they can see how they can go from this degree right into the workforce, which is what we want for them. Um, you know, in, in, from 2018 to 2019, uh, we had about a 14% increase in, in our uh, enrollment. And that was a historic number for us at the time. It was about 1,000 and about 1,124 students on our campus. We're on track for this year to exceed those numbers. Um, and we have, you know, new academic programs on the books. So I, can, I, I see us continuing to have those kind of increases in our enrollment as we, you know, start our um, graduate program in physician assistance. Um, that, that will start in the fall. Um, and then we have some, you know, doctorate level programs as well as some certificate programs that we're beginning to offer here on campus too. So that's going to be a trend that I expect us to continue to see. So you mentioned it briefly, my niece is looking for a physician's assistant program. So when I saw this and all the accomplishments, I was especially interested in this. So tell us about offering that program. That is wonderful. Yeah. So, so we will have soon, I think in the next couple of months, our accreditation visit. Um, we've been preparing for that. We submitted all of our paperwork and um, students will be able to come here on this campus and um, pursue their physician assistance. Uh, degree as well as you know we have our clinic system our hospital uh, that they'll be able to do their clinicals in as well as interacting with the medical students here on our campus um, while they're getting their education so it. it's very exciting I know that you know many students within the OSU system or even in the area really wanting that degree and to be able to do that right here in Tulsa is a it's a huge accomplishment. It is, that's wonderful. Okay, so we know research plays a big role in all the efforts here at the Center for Health Sciences. So bring us up to date on the research initiatives going on. Tell us what's the latest. Yeah, so, so we have you know, really made some significant strides um, really in research as well. When you go back to you know, 2015, um, we had about, our, in grants and in contracts, um, about 48 million. Um, now we're we're really roughly around 86 million and so we've had an 80 percent increase and we continue to see you know that growing as you know we have many researchers who um, have received NIH funding which really speaks to their scholarship um, you know to really Dr. Hayes Grudo, uh, uh, Julie Croft, um, Valerie Bluebird Jernigan and um, 
uh, Matt, Dr. Matt Vassar are a few that have received NIH funding. We, we see that continuing to grow um, as we've, you know, really um, in the last year, I think it's been about a year since we um, signed an agreement with Purdue Pharma to receive some of their research assets, which w is really one of the largest biorepositories in the United States, which is uh, biological samples from about 15 years worth of clinical research, as well as um, you know, medical records uh, attached to that. Um, in addition, we have about 15,000 molecules that are can be, you know, um, are there for discovery for non-opioid pain medications, and those are unique. Um, that that puts us very in a very good situation as we're growing the National Center for Wellness and Recovery with our existing researchers and bringing in researchers to to take advantage of the Hill Initiative and more NIH funding. So, I, I think we're you know we're seeing these these big increases, but I I anticipate that we'll continue to see that kind of increase with you know, every, all the projects we have going and the researchers that are here, as well as what we anticipate bringing in. So let's back up for a minute to February, because we're looking at everything that we've accomplished in the past year. President Trump um, made an announcement, um, $120 million in his proposed budget for a VA hospital in Tulsa. So what role will you guys be playing in that? Yeah, so, you know, we were very excited to see that that was included in his budget. Um, we have made great prog progress on really bringing the, the VA hospital to Tulsa to be located next to the OSU Medical Center. Uh, we kind of refer to that as the Academic Hill Center campus, as well as a, a state mental health hospital to be located there. Um, as a part of that, that's about a $210 million construction project. Um, the uh, county and city have participated. The city passed uh, an $8 million uh, as a part of their planning for a parking structure, so that's been funded for there. So a new parking structure that will be across from the Cox Business Center um, and located there on, on that Academic Health Center campus. We've partnered very closely with the um, Ann and Henry Zero Foundation um, and have raised $23 million from in, in, in philanthropic support for this project across the city. Uh, and so we're, we're waiting and anticipating that um, in January we'll re receive the funding from the VA to go ahead and break ground on that project. Uh, what that really allows us to do is to expand one graduate medical education. So between those two facilities that will increase the number of residency slots that are funded um, by 100. And you know that is huge for the state. Uh, so that is new funding in perpetuity and um, new residency positions. So um, that is a way for us to attract uh, physicians to come here and train and stay in Oklahoma, um, but also to retain our physicians um, that we're graduating from the medical school and from our new Cherokee Nation campus to, to that facility. So we're, we're very excited about uh, what that can do the partnership and the way that it was envisioned um, by in, um, Senator Inhofe and Senator Lankford uh, was really a partnership with the OSU Medical Center so that you know some of the care that's provided to veterans will occur inside of our hospital and that'll be a close working relationship. We've started doing some joint hires uh, for physicians for the VA and it's, it's much needed for veterans. Um, and when we looked really at where veterans are living and how they're able to access care, uh, having, having that um, VA hospital there um, on bus routes right here in Tulsa uh, was most convenient. And we're really excited to be able to partner with the VA to provide care to veterans. It is huge for our veterans, and what a great partnership that is going to be. So we, I know you are here in the city of Tulsa, but you guys have a big emphasis in rural communities as well. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk a little bit about the effort in rural communities, especially when it comes to accessible you know, addiction treatment and other things like that. Right. Well, so, so yeah, our mission is focused on um, rural health care. 
and you know that's something that you know we've been very committed to fulfilling and really in everything we do and in, in all the projects there are kind of two ways that you know as a leadership team we look at things you know our mission being for you know rural and underserved Oklahoma um, you know with veterans underserved and so that fit in nicely with what we do with graduate medical education as well as the po populations we serve um, rural Oklahoma, everything that we really do, we think about that. Um, that's why it was such a great partnership with the Cherokee Nation to be able to, you know, train medical students from day one all the way, you know, through residency training if they chose uh, right in a rural community um, and in an underserved area as well. Um, so, you know, some of the other initiatives that we worked on even during the pandemic you know, we partnered with the state to provide telemedicine services across the state so that, you know, patients could stay in those rural communities. If our urban centers really got overrun and the hospitals were having a challenge, we could support those rural hospitals in keeping their patients and, and give them that physician support. And so we, we have used, you know, telemedicine really as a way um, to help access for care for, for people living in, in um, rural areas, as well as Project ECHO, which is you know, a way that what we look at that is really as an educational tool that is a force multiplier. So what we're doing is we're really working with frontline workers or primary care physicians, providers that are across the state to provide specialty education to them in a way that they receive, like what we receive in residence residency so like once a week with Project Echo they will meet um, and for 20 minutes they'll get a lecture and then they can present patients and the panel of experts here gives them advice and so I learn from your patients you learn from mine and over a period of time you become an expert um, so what we're really trying to do in that model is to provide expert or specialty knowledge to providers that are in rural parts of the state so those patients can you know stay close to home and you know receive the care that they need in their communities but that also frees up the specialist to take care of the sickest of the sick patients and so when when we partnered with the University of New Mexico to put that here in Oklahoma you know they had done a study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that patients outcomes when they were receiving their care in their community with their primary care physician were just as good as receiving care at a academic health center with a team of specialists, and even better than if they were going to a solo specialist in a community. Um, and so we, we've really focused on that as well. So as we've taken, you know, kind of what we do with the National Center for Wellness and Recovery, which is here in Tulsa, um, and, and you know, our focus is really on research, providing care to Oklahomans, um, we always have that in the back of our mind that, you know, our goal is not to have everyone trying to travel to us. Um, that when pe people need care or they're in a crisis, they need it right then at the most convenient way in the closest location. So what we have done is taken um, our, what we refer to as virtual medication assisted treatment, which is kind of telehealth, and partnered with community health, mental health centers across the state, um, federally qualified health centers to really provide our, our physician services in those communities. And right now we're in four counties. Um, we anticipate being in seven counties by the end of October. Um, with, a, with really that would encompass 35 different locations across the state. And so that's something that we're really proud of. We, we anticipate that that will continue to grow. We have a lot of care models that we're trying to put into place um, so that people across the state and families that are struggling um, perhaps with, you know, uh, addiction or, or in individuals can really get the support they need in their communities. And then that also goes back to allowing, you know, our physicians here to take care of those really, really difficult patients and to see those, those patients as needed. It's such a huge benefit not to think I have to drive two hours. Right to get really quality health care, mm -hmm. that I can get it right there because yes. if you guys are making that possible, I mean, that's just, that is such a huge benefit for people. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Okay, well, I can't imagine what you're gonna do <laughs> in 2021 after everything that you guys have accomplished this year. It's just been such an amazing year. Um, what is on the horizon for right. next year? Well, so, you know, we, we still have 
obviously some, as everybody knows, some construction projects going yeah. on in yeah. growth. Um, some of those are going to be wrapping up by, you know, the end of this year. Um, our, our Legacy Plaza, which will be home to the National Center for Wellness and Recovery, that will be completed and we'll have faculty moving, you know, into that facility, uh, as well as our clinical research uh, center that we're putting in place with the National Center for Wellness and Recovery that's on Riverside. So, you know, many of our faculty members in OSU community and the wider community may not be aware of that, but that will be an imaging center and a clinical trials uh, center there on Riverside. Um, we're really excited about that, but that should be completed by the end of the year. And, and then our Cherokee Nation campus, during COVID we had to stop construction um, of that building, but we're back on track and, and they are working very hard. That should be completed by the end of this year. Um, next year we still have, you know, the North Hall, which we'll, we'll be, you know, working on and of course you know, everyone who's here on campus will be aware. It kind of creates a little inconvenience for everyone, but you know, the progress is exciting. Um, we'll start on our, we have a, a, a fifth floor of our forensic science building that was shelled out research space um, that really, I believe that building was completed in 2009. So it's been there, we were waiting for the right project. And so we, we're getting ready to, to start completing that. That'll be um, more research space and animal vivarium. Um, and so that will house some of the research uh, for the National Center for Wellness and Recovery. So that project is going to be starting in the next year. And then of course, you know, our new academic programs uh, will, be, will be moving forward. And we hope that, you know, when we get the funding in January, um, we'll begin to see some, you know, uh, construction work happening over on the Academic Medical Center campus. So um, there's there's quite a bit going on, um, still a lot of exciting projects that um, will continue to happen here in the next year. It is exciting when you look out the window, yes. and I know yeah. it could look like a mess, but what I see is this is growth. I mean, this is potential. This is so great, and it'll all be worth the inconvenience in the end. So we've covered a lot of topics today and a lot each topic is more impressive than the next when we talk about the accomplishments but is there anything else that you'd want to say that you want to tell the folks um, no you know I, I think that all of these things have have really been possible because of the wonderful faculty and staff that are here um, that are also at the hospital that are really you know committed to our mission committed to our students and, and really dedicated to serving the state um, that's what really makes you know, the OSU family special is, is that level of commitment. And it really, you know, it, it's, it's a privilege for me to get to lead um, a, a group of people like that because, you know, when there is um, a need, they're always quick to step up. And I think it was more apparent this last year with the pandemic, but it's, you know, it's always been very apparent to me as I'm here, as we start, you know, talking about you know, new projects or things that we want to do or needs across the state. Um, there's never been a time where there wasn't someone who was willing to, to step up and take that on. And these things, you know, can't be accomplished just by the leadership. It's really the people within the institution and that's what makes this place special. So I think, you know, I would just thank them for their commitment to our, our students, to our mission and to the state. It's not cliche to say it takes the entire team, and it really does. Yes. And you certainly can't get this level of accomplishment. What an amazing, incredible year it's been. What a jewel to the community um, this facility is. It's just, it's really, really impressive. So thank you for letting me be a part of this, and thank you, Dr. Casey Schrum, for telling us all about what's happening this year. Well, I'd like to, once again, thank you all for your contributions. We really would not be where we are today without the collective contributions of our OSU family. And so now we'd like to take a moment to celebrate our OSU CHS family members who have reached some significant milestones in their career. And congratulations to all of our uh, years of service um, honorees today.